But um, now it's the case that I think we're going to start uh, the, um, the panel, I believe is, is next, with three people. Um, and I'm, I may have to ask them to, um, uh, can you guys turn on your cameras now and let's make sure that you can all share if you wish to share anything. You may not have anything you want to share. Let me make sure I've made you co-host. Okay, uh, Alejandra, are you gonna be sharing any slides? No. Okay. Um, and uh, Dr. Eva Baroni. Okay, so let me try to introduce these people. I've prepared a set of questions for them. Um, I think Debbie's talk was a great lead in to this. Um, I don't know as much as I should about all of our speakers today. First, let me introduce Dr. Nelson Eva Barone. Am I pronouncing your name close to anywhere close to correctly? Can you tell us how you pronounce your name? Eva Barone. Eva Barone. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Forgive me uh, for that. Um, so uh, uh, he is an alive scholar. Uh, I forget which nation you're from. You're currently in South Africa, but you come from another nation in vaccinology. Um, and one of the reasons that he's invited here is he recently wrote an essay on the need for Africa-wide regulatory harmonization. And, and I, if I've got that wrong, please uh, correct me. Um, and I'll have him introduce himself in just a second when I've done the other people. Um, Andrew Lamb, uh, runs Field Ready or is the global innovation leader for Field Ready. He's also um, on the board of Helpful Engineering. My understanding is that Field Ready focuses on local manufacture uh, and has had some success with that and uh, works in both Africa and the Middle East. And uh, Andrew can say a little bit more about himself in a minute. Um, and um, Alejandra Velez, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, is with the World Health Organization. Um, and I, I actually can't do uh, any more of an introduction um, than that. But I'd like to, to welcome you all uh, here. And I'm going to go um, find my questions. Maybe, Alejandra, you could start and tell us a little bit more about yourself as I'm getting the questions ready. Thank you, Rob. Um, well, I am. Uh, my name is too long, as it appears on the on the platform. So you may have heard me also uh, call Laura. So my name is Laura Alejandra Vélez. I am Mexican biomedical engineer. Um, at the beginning of my career, one of my I, I think it was my second job actually was in the Ministry of Health of Mexico in COFEPRIS in the regulatory agency. And then I worked seven years in the Ministry of Health of Mexico. And since 10 years ago, I left uh, to work in the humanitarian and emergency sector. Uh, part of this time with Medi uh, Doctors Without Borders, uh, I had the opportunity to, to be in different countries, almost 10 countries in different periods of, of time and uh, in different also continents. And then after that, I, I work a bit with uh, UNDP and then back to the World Health Organizations where, where, I am, where I am working since three years ago in the emergency response. And since uh, two years ago, specifically in the COVID response, uh, my main work now, it is to the Oxygen Scale-Up Initiative uh, in collaboration to, with the case management team and I know many of the colleagues here, and of course, lead and other and other that are on the on the field of oxygen and respiratory devices. Uh, that's me. Nice to meet you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Andrew. Can you say something I may have missed about Field Ready or, or yourself? Sure. The um, uh, the main thing about Field Ready is that we're a humanitarian organization. We were founded by aid workers that wanted to transform the way that aid is supplied. And at the moment, that involves, you know, centralized mass production and stockpiling in regional warehouses around the world, and then flying goods into a disaster zone, um, uh, often um, at a very expensive and it takes a very long time to, to get there. Field Ready's approach is to try and locally manufacture those same aid supplies. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, Dr. Eva Brenny, um, I'd like to start with you. 
Um, and I, I believe I'm describing it correctly, but I may not be. You've written an essay calling for Africa-wide harmonization of regulatory practice. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your ideas uh, along those lines? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Rob. I'm delighted to be with you all today. Um, just a quick introduction. So, um, Dr. Nelson Evaberene, I'm in Nigeria. I'm currently in Nigeria, actually. And um, so I've worked across the different uh, level of the health uh, sector in Nigeria, from primary to tertiary for about um, four years. Before I left, to, I went to London to pursue further studies in global health and uh, development. So currently, I'm still studying, you know, in, with uh, the University of Wits in um, South Africa. And I also work with the nonprofits that do uh, work on vaccine equity. And so, yeah, so, um, so I, I wrote on the need for so actually, I've, I, I actually prepared like this. So I'm just going to talk uh, off. And um, yeah, so I wrote on the need for a continental wide regulation. So in Africa, like we all know that uh, access to medical products, medicines are critical in achieving universal coverage in all countries. You know, at the same time, this must be safe, efficacious, good qualities. And not just that, they also must be locally adaptable and acceptable you know, to the community. But in um, Africa, there are several gaps, you know, in access to this uh, medical product. So I think a key part in enabling this access is ongoing regu regulatory um, harmonization. So the, the contest here, yeah, there are 55 countries in Africa and the 54 of them, they have their own national regulatory body. You know, although not all of them can perform you know, most of the core regulatory function. And uh, they have small markets. You know. And uh, these 55 countries, they are grouped into eight regional economic communities you know, that facilitate trades you know, and access to goods and movement of people. So what is implied yeah, like as a researcher or as a manufacturer, if you are bringing your products to, to the continent, this means that you have to go to the process of, reg of registration in each country. So that is very cumbersome. And we've, asked, we've had uh, instances where some products have been delayed or they are not available as a result of this regulatory barrier. For a regulatory body with all the core competence, it was noted that the time submission of your product to approval usually takes between four to seven years. So that is a huge delay for many communities that need access to this product. So what we see is the proliferation of substandard products, you know, because most of the most of the borders they are very porous. You know, I think Nigeria and Cameroon. It, alone you have more than seven borders and most of the times you can just walk you know through so these are routes for like smuggling of substandard medical products so this delay costs counterfeit irrational use and um, eventually you know a lot of people get to like so with the COVID-19 uh, or, or, or prior or prior, prior Prior to the COVID, there have been several efforts at harmonizing medical regulation in the continent. So in 2009, they launched what they called the African, uh, African uh, Medical Harmonization Initiative. So this was piloted in several economic communities. So what they discovered like in East Africa, the time for submission of products to approval was decreased Know, by, by like 30 to like 40 percent so so the uh, the idea behind me calling for a wider continental framework 
we, we've seen that uh, we need we need institutions that are competent, you know, to to facilitate like emergency use, quick access. So right now, what we call the African Free Trade Continental Agreements is to facilitate trade in the whole continent, like bringing the whole eight regional communities together, you know, under one body where they can trade and exchange goods and services. So for me to move my medical product or vaccine from one community to the other, you know, if we have like a harmonized framework, you just show maybe your paperwork and pass. So that is most of the uh, regulatory bottleneck. You know, so apart from that, the African um, CDC with the African Union, they just launched what we call the partnership to accelerate vaccine manufacturing in the continent. And uh, for you to incentivize most manufacturer, you know, most uh, partnership, you know, from Western firms and rest, they have to be sure that, oh, okay, product that, that we're going to make could be distributed, you know, to everywhere, like the wider markets. You know, so that is also critical. Then Ted, I think the issue of uh, trust, the issue of trust in um, biomedical uh, innovations or access to that is very critical in acceptability. And in the past, we have instances of, uh, we have, we have uh, there's a history in Africa regarding Western uh, innovations or medical intervention. You know, in many communities, one of them, which I cited, was in Kano State in '96 in Nigeria, a case that involved uh, Pfizer. You know, a clinical trial was done without, you know, appropriate approval. So this led to the death of about 11 children. You know, so over time, this has led to like skepticism. You know, for like Western based and even most local. So if we have like a continental wide regulatory body. So it's going to ease trade, it's going to ease access, and it's going to ease trust. You know, yeah. So those are like the the ideas you know which I had. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, good luck with that. Um, I wonder if um, Alejandra has any um, opinions uh, about that, that is the idea of each nation having its own regulatory system or banding together as the European Union has done, or in a sense, as the United States has done, you know, because we, we have different geographic regions, but we have one federal authority when it comes to um, medical regulation. Well, I, I, I will um, express my opinion more in general than specifically the case of Africa. Um, in general, as, as everything it needs to be addressed uh, in a multisystemic and multidimensional approach, like my, uh, the other presenters did uh, say at the beginning of, the, of this um, conference. Um, you know, there are some, uh, the traditional regulation, it's linked to the national health systems. And so it needs to, it's linked to the strength of the ministries of health or the national health systems. In many countries that the World Health Organization work, uh, we consider them um, fragile or vulnerable. So it means that there is no a strong ministry of health that could back up uh, the regulation or the uh, commercialization of uh, local manufacturing devices. Um, also traditionally, you know, there are different ways to approach regulation, FDA, does a kind of approval, which means they receive and they re, uh, the dossiers and they review them and they have a third laboratories that certifies the devices. In the uh, European Communion, for example, it's a declaration of conformity of the devices. So there is a lot of trust in the manufacturers that they will come and show that uh, their, their device is, is ready to be used and it has been tested. And of course, this trust means that the manufacturer is responsible also for the post market and for the techno vigilance of these devices. So there are many differences to do so. And, and depends also uh, in all the resources that you have to review and approve these, these devices. We are talking about more than 10,000 medical devices. 
And if we, I have been reviewing for quality assurance on medical equipment, and, and we know the medical equipment come with the accessories, with consumables, with uh, different uh, components that needs to be assessed. And fortunately, we cannot have in the ministries of health the, the expertise of each of these type of equipment or type of devices to do the approval. So that's why, as, as uh, Nelson said, it's a lot of link, link to the trust that the people is giving you the, the information, the appropriate information, and that you have people that can go through the review of these documents. Other problem that I have seen while doing these uh, approvals, for example, is the um, uh, legality of the documents. So there is a lot of uh, things that are not translated in different uh, languages or that we cannot, we are doing the evaluation normally uh, through documents, not through really verification of the site or verification of the equipment because we, normally governments doesn't have the resources to do so. So, so you, you are doing everything from the desk. And again, it, it means that the manufacturers are very responsible of giving you the right information and, and in the correct um, transcription to be understood. Uh, so I think the alliance might be between nations that have uh, shared similarities or share similar situation. Of course, collaboration is always a way to go. I, I, I believe on that. Um, but I, I, I think it needs to be developed further, which kind of regions can be together and what is the situation or the context that they, they have to, to do so. Um, yeah, I think maybe it could be an option to have a, a humanitarian regulatory network that could give uh, the appropriate uh, advice on this kind of devices. Uh, also because uh, the context in the humanitarian where there is also conflict or uh, natural disasters, it's a different approach of a stable uh, nation or country where we are approaching a, a, national, a stable national uh, system with developing the hospitals or the other um, health centers. Um, and the, the last point I wanted to do, it is regulation for me, it's very linked also to the donations. And, and I think um, one of the big problems that we have seen in, in a lot of developing countries and the humanitarian sector, uh, as um, Denise mentioned also, is we receive uh, mainly 80 to 90% of the equipment donated. And so even it's already approved in a, a high income country or, or it's uh, for, for internal use or for external use like the EF, FDA does, it may be not appropriate uh, for, the, for the country. So maybe uh, it could be two approaches. One is to approve local manufacturing and innovation inside the regions or countries that want, but also uh, like let's say a fast track of analysis of quality assurance of the equipment that comes already approved, but to know if it is really appropriate for the, for the context, uh, context that it's meant to be used. Okay, well, thank you very much. So maybe Andrew can tie some of this together. So I guess I have two specific questions for Andrew. First is, um, does field ready deal with the manufactured devices which are covered by regulation and and secondly how do you see local manufacture fitting in with open source ideas in general thanks rob and uh we do i mean we um we have often have to spend some time working out what uh, regulations apply because you know is it uh, the European standard, the you know, will the ISO standard be acceptable? Or if you're, you know, do you have to comply with the standards of the organization that's funding you? So if you have American government funding, do you have to be FDA compliant, even if you're operating somewhere in a remote island in the South Pacific? Um, national regulations are increasingly emerging and they have emerged over the course of the pandemic that we, we do um look out for as well so once we've worked out if and if so which um regulations might apply then quite frankly we that that's a factor in our decision over what we're going to make it's it helps us to choose whether we make, might make something or not um and um you know part of the reason for that is that we're a humanitarian organization so we provide items medical devices at no cost to the people who need them and um because if if we were selling them we wouldn't be you know um 
helping people because they're human. We would we would be falling foul of humanitarian principles. So um, often a lot of the regulations will only kick in if you're making sales and we might be making donations. Um, that doesn't mean that we hold ourselves, we don't hold ourselves to those standards. In fact, we do a lot of self-certification. And so we self-certify for things that we make against standards that we purchase from you know, international standards bodies. We help local makers and manufacturers to comply with national or international standards. And in some ways, we might provide a bit of an interface in the sense that um, we, uh, our engineers in the field are increasingly not makers. They are quality control engineers, quality assurance people. And that they are the ones that make sure that what is being made meets, you know, what was in the, the, as the design intended and, um, and meets, meets this fit for purpose. So often what happens is that we might end up being the ones winning the contracts because the local makers and manufacturers may never be able to do that, get through the procurement procedures. Um, but then we are responsible for making sure we're the ones that take the risk that those items um, meet standards. Now, absolutely. I mean, I think that the local, does local manufacture fit with open source? I'm, I'm, I want to work towards a future where we can, we can produce things in a batch size of one in thousands of places. So, you know, if, if a national hospital network, if a national health system, as we might call it in the UK, needs some new machines, they could be made in the local makerspace. They could be made in the local, um, in the hospital's own workshops. Um, even if that design comes from, you know, Philips or Siemens or General Electric or um, an open hardware, uh, community like like um, uh, we've seen emerge over the course of the pandemic. So a batch size of one being made in thousands of places, where literally governments could place an order for massive numbers of small production contracts, or to make identical items across a huge geographic area, each providing the local market or responding to local needs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know some of those makers might be refugees. They might be um, in refugee camps. They might be the host communities. Supporting them, or they may be biomedical engineers in, in um, the hospitals of wealthy countries or whatever. But I think it's the idea that, we're, that the paradigm of production is going to shift from centralized mass production to decentralized um, distributed production, where actually, over the course of any given day, what we think of as a factory or a production line might make a hundred different items. <laughs> in the course of the day, rather than the same item over and over and over again. What does that mean about for open source? It means we, we, we can't, it means that the open hardware community is at the cutting edge of this new paradigm of production because we, whilst, you know, we have a, a license fee issue to sort out, I'm sure, when we're paying royalties over intellectual property, but open hardware will get there first. It will move faster. What we need to figure out next is, um, licensing according to usage, you know, royalties paid for um, in times when the market is stable, just as um, Laura was talking about. But then perhaps, you know, the designers might waive the loyalties on their design, the royalties on their designs in cases where there's a humanitarian application, because makers have got to earn a living. You know, <laughs> it's 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 not as if you can do all of this design work for free. All of this means that open source hardware has to have really good documentation, not just about the design, but about the process of making it, as we heard from one of the previous speakers today. Okay, so um, I have to, so I have to apologize. We're a little behind time. Um, George Contreras, you're going to have to plan to go a little bit late because I don't, I don't want to cut cut off this panel. It's my fault. I've let times get a little. Um, behind us here. I'm going to skip the second round of questioning and go to the third round that, that I had. But uh, before I do that, Andrew, what percentage of the devices you build right now are in some sense derived from open source designs? All of them. Really? Okay. Um, we reverse engineer quite a, quite a lot. Um, uh -huh. But then we publish those reverse engineer designs as open source hardware. All of them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there, there was um, one occasion actually when we helped a local local 
I'm, tr I'm trying to think of an exception. There was one occasion where we helped a local entrepreneur in Nepal get a patent on his uh, cook stove burner design, which is a really good design, which is really important. He was only the 16th patent holder in the entire country, uh, but he's open sourced it for commercialization outside of Nepal. Okay, okay. So let me shift gears now. And I want to talk about something that I think is, is pretty obvious from from Dr. Nelson's idea to um, what Andrew was talking about to what the World Health Organization supports. And that is the boost to local economy and repair and maintenance and supply chain resilience by allowing local manufacture. Right now, it seems to me harmonizing regulation makes local manufacture more reasonable in a way because a market in one of 27 African nations, if the device would be open to other nations, which are just right next door, if there were an Africa-wide regulatory regime without having to go through several regulatory actions. Um, but let me start with Andrew because uh, I think he maybe knows more about manufacture in this. Can you, can you just talk about how you see this affecting both local economies and in particular the issues that Debbie Aloyo raised of repairability and maintenance? Um, it's hard to think of a downside. It's, it's really hard to think of a downside. So repair and maintenance, absolutely. One of the things that we're trying to uh, do more is attach QR codes onto the devices that we make so that people not only can get a, you know get information about how to properly use the devices, uh, but get in touch with us, with, with us if there's anything wrong with them, but also get access to the documentation and the design files so they can make and repair it themselves. Um, the local job creation aspect is really important. I think there is a, um, a uh, I'm hesitating to say prejudice, but I think there is an assumption that manufacturing capabilities don't exist inside you know refugee camps or in in many sort of very uh, remote and, and and poor communities but actually when you look at particularly young younger generation people coming through um able to use um machines 3d printers uh, computer aided design you know i, th I think the, the repair the livelihoods the affordability and then particularly for the humanitarian sector, the carbon benefit of locally manufacturing, because we have, we're flying stuff all that we're flying soap around the planet. Why are we doing that? Just make it in the camp, you know? Right, right. right. So um, Ms. Velez, does the World Health Organization have policies related to local manufacturing of medical devices? Um, the, we have, uh, the innovative compendium of technologies that I think is the third one. This this work is done in the in the Department of Social Medicine, coordinated by Adriana Velasquez, who is a uh, biomedical engineer from, uh, from from many many years, and and she uh, uh, she's coordinating this. Um, th this compendium uh, aims to collect uh, information of, about different uh, local manufacturer devices or even devices that are manufactured, in, for example, in the UK, but that uh, intend to be used in, in low and middle income countries. Um, the, the devices need to pass as every other device, all the analysis of, and testing and prototype uh, time to ensure that they are for quality and safety. Uh, I am uh, also reading a question uh, from, from the panel, that from the uh, uh, people that says that if WHO procures these, these devices, and, and I want to explain something, WHO is not considered a procuring agency, though for the emergency specifically, we have been procuring uh, devices, but we are not, uh, we don't have a big department for quality assurance or for, or for example, for prequalification. It's only de dedicated to in vitro diagnostic. So even if this compendium exists, um, as, as we have been saying, to be considered that, that a device is uh, safe and qualified to be used in a context, it needs to pass through, through a lot of uh, reviews that WHO doesn't have the, the, the people doing it. So we, for, for the time being, we have procured devices that are already approved by what we consider the strong uh, regulatory ministries. But of course, it's a way to go forward because the countries that we support are needing it. 
And, and it is something that uh, we would like to, to, to find a middle point where these devices are already ready to be used in, in the context uh, we work. Um, I wanted also to say that uh, it's not only the development of innovative technologies, but also I, I, I would like to add that to add the monitoring of the use of them and what is the impact on health? Because sometimes we can develop many things and, and are they really neither or, or essential for, for, the, for the health? That will be the approach that WHO will have. Are they essential or not? Um, and then the process of adaptation and adoption of the devices is something also that we share with the responsibility with the ministries of health. It is uh, very important that we receive information from the context that uh, received the, the equipment that we sent for a donation. Because if not, it happens what uh, David described. Uh, equipment is not uh, installed, they just receive it, but it's not installed or implement or, or use. So it's, a, it's to follow the, all the life cycle, uh, what we are trying to promote at WHO. I will put the link of the compendium, and also there is a lot of publications for medical devices that talks about sustainability, uh, the commissioning, uh, and regulation. So I will put the links on the, the chat. OK. So um, we're, we're going over time here. Um, uh, there's a question from Leith Greenslade. Um, maybe you can read that in the Zoom chat and be prepared to answer it. Um, Alejandra, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to ask Dr. Nelson something first. And for, forgive me if I'm misunderstanding. I know Africa is a big place. It's three times larger than North America, and it's got 27 diverse nations or maybe more. Um, you know. Let's say you're a hospital administrator. I don't know if you are right now, Dr. Nelson. You know, how do you decide to trust locally manufactured metal, medical equipment? Would you prefer to have locally manufactured equipment or would you prefer, you know, Swiss and German made equipment or how do you make that decision? You're still muted, I think. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Sorry, it's an easy okay. mistake. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question of trust in um, local innovation, local manufacturing, I think um, I think I will try to contextualize it with the local production of medicines. Like we have pharmaceutical industry, yeah, you know, that do produce medicines and the rest, and they would like. What makes us decide, you know, to try these drugs? Okay, if it's is it safe, you know, is it of good quality, is it efficient? So I think those same factors that you know that we look at, you know, in uh, medicines and the rest, you know, they also apply to medical equipment and medical uh, products. So when when I was in medical practice, then, you know, other things that we look at the hospital level, okay, uh, is it flexible? You know, can we use it in this particular settings? Because a lot of speakers, they've mentioned, oh, like some technology that are not really acceptable. And it, it was not uncommon in my own center where I work. You know, yeah, in most cases, maybe we get like a foreign equipment or technology and uh, the technical know-how doesn't even exist. You know? Like for example, the defibrillator and the rest, you know, it doesn't exist, maybe we've never used it before. So those are the things that we look at. So right. in terms of local manufacturing, the quality, safety, efficiency, and the local flexibility, basically. Right. So, I mean, we've heard the word testing about a hundred times, you know, here. I, I, I wanna point out something that as a software engineer, software systems have developed automated unit test as a best practice for dealing with things. I don't believe hardware and in particular open source hardware manufacturing has developed the same level of testing rigor, but I believe it's possible. And I believe the community we're trying to address here can do a better job. We, we can make devices which are more easily tested and which have their test data documented as a part of their basic design design features. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, 
so Leith Greenslade uh, asked, but Alejandra or Ali, do you think the do you think the World Health Organization could do more to encourage investment slash use of open source medical technology by issuing policy statements and guidance, et cetera? I think definitely we could do more. Um, I think we will need to debate uh, until which extent, uh, knowing all the, the risk uh, and the actors that may be involved on it. And I think also that uh, we will need to, to search for narrowing which medical devices and that we are looking for accessibility, affordability, and appropriateness of the devices. Um, yeah, because we need to consider the interest of all, all the actors and the implications that could be uh, about uh, misuse or misimplementation uh, of, of some devices. Okay. You know, would some of us have talked in the panel last time we talked about uh, uh, Armapri Rai talked about the fact that it really doesn't matter if something is open source or not. It really just the testing and the regulation go into it. It doesn't matter if the source happens to be open source or not, because it's going to have to if it's if it's the kind of device that requires regulatory approval, it's going to require regulatory approval irrespective of the source in which it's designed. So I now need to uh, need to apologize. Um, I have to end this panel in order to get on to um, Professor Contreras and, and the other talks. I should have allowed more time for this. It's always a balancing act because people don't wanna be here all day. I really appreciate you guys taking the time, um, especially those of you who, who are not coming, maybe all of you are not coming from my time zone here in uh, in the United States. Thank you very very much. I would ask if you if you can, all of you go to Rehive. There's one question here to Alejandra from Pedro Guzman in the Q and A session, but I'd like to ask you to answer that in Rehive or in the chat here, okay. so that I can introduce um, George Contreras uh, for for his talk. Um, now remember, I renamed the table meet the speakers. And so all of you who wish to speak to either Alejandra Belez, Nelson Evabarone, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it, or Andrew Lamb, go to meet the speakers table and talk